How fine do you think we should go on this? Uh, what's the range? One, two, nine. With small well, little increments. You're, you're probably, I mean, going too fine would be a disaster because yeah. it just clogs up. Yeah. So you're probably safe between six and seven. You don't want to go any finer than that without knowing more about it. That's Scott Rayo. He is a coffee guru, maybe the coffee guru. His opinions on roasting coffee and brewing coffee and really most everything about the science of coffee, and there's a lot of science in coffee, are sought out by everyone in the world of specialty coffee. I drink specialty coffee, so his words are gold to me. So you know how the last few beans we call it popcorn but they just never want to go down? Right. So if you if you are using it at home regularly for the same coffee over and over, fill the hopper because preventing the popcorning makes the grind more even. Oh, okay. But when a, when a bean's popcorn, the ones that go in last end up being quite a bit coarser than everything else. Uh, okay, gotcha. I'm a little nervous. I'm making coffee for Scott, the best I can using the equipment in the office. I don't know the grinder, our kettle is not well suited to the task, and like an idiot, I grab the wrong filter. But I crave the feedback, no matter how brutal. demo once for you so just just something like that just okay. as a way of that is called the shot. rail spin <laughs> all right we're gonna see and i know he'll be honest <laughs> <laughs> i have an unfortunate reputation for honesty in coffee you know we we got a little bitterness and astringency do you feel the dryness in your mouth I do, yeah. that's that's not your fault it had to do with trying to deal with that kettle in that scenario because the kettle is not very precise mm -hmm. and so there were some when you have parts of the coffee bed that you overuse, you get the astringency, you get the dryness. It's it's the same as when you leave a tea bag in for too long, you take a sip of tea and it feels dry in your tongue. Right. So that, that's that's created primarily by tannins, we believe. And um, that's usually coming from, like I said before, that you were trying to break up channels. It's usually coming from channels or, or using some of the coffee bed more than other parts. Gotcha. So, but it's not terrible. No. But, um, Did you taste any flavors? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it's a Kenya, and it, it's you know, on on the, if I were to reach a little bit, I'd say it has a little bit of a, a blueberry and sort of a, like a very ripe note to it, but it's the the astringency is really taking over my mouth. So right, the astringency tends to hurt your perception of body. The the roundness of a coffee tends to make things taste a little two dimensional rather than three dimensional. So although the acidity is pleasing, there's a little bit of like a tree barky unpleasant flavor, and there's there's that you know little bit of fruit. You know, peeping in, but but I think you know uh, when you make it at home, you'll probably get a lot more fruit out of it. Okay. You're listening to the Grow Wire podcast, a place where you will learn the ins and outs of growing a business, running a business, or even taking your big idea, career, or personal development to the next level. It's all possible. Our host, Fritz Nelson, the editor-in-chief of GrowWire.com, will take you on an exploration of growth through candid conversations with some of the most brilliant minds in entrepreneurship, entertainment, business development, and more. Whatever your goal, we know you'll walk away with the right tools to help fuel your journey of growth. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Grow Wire podcast. Today, I want to talk about coffee. I am fascinated by it. I've learned more in the past two years than I thought possible, and yet, I still know so little. I thought I was a coffee nerd, but I'm not even close. I attended the Specialty Coffee Association Expo last year and I talked to everyone. I drank lots of coffee, I wrote articles, I bored my friends and family. But talking about the quality of coffee is like talking about the quality of just about anything. Certainly coffee shares a lot in common with wine, but also really any endeavor where being the best requires invention discovery, trial and error, data and science, and above all, relentless attention to detail. If you want to know why a cup of coffee can cost $5, you're going to find out. But we're really going to just scratch the surface because great coffee requires understanding chemistry and physics and math. Now, I'm starting this conversation with someone I've admired from afar, 
someone that most people in the coffee industry think of as one of the top coffee gurus in the world. Scott Rayo, highly sought after coffee consultant, author, and businessman. Scott, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. I want to start out with the Specialty Coffee Associ Association Expo because as we are recording this, it just happened a few days ago. So you were there. Did you taste anything that took you by surprise? The, the dirty secret in the industry is that it's pretty hard to get an amazing cup of coffee during the expo. There's a lot of expensive coffees, and there's a lot of um, pretty decent coffees, but for one reason or another, the coffee on the floor is, is usually a little disappointing. Uh, one of my good friends, uh, a man named Alessandro from Bologna, Italy, was competing in the World Barista Championship Finals, and I was lucky enough after his routine, he invited me backstage, and he, he brewed this... He's not allowed to keep extra of the coffee that he serves during the competition, but he, he had some extra grounds and he brewed me a cup so that I could taste it. Um, and that was quite nice. That was, uh, uh, as you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of something called naturals, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point today. It's a, it's a type of coffee, but it's a co type of coffee processing. But it was a very expensive natural, several hundred dollars a pound. And it was, you know, unique coffee. So even though it wasn't my style of coffee, it's exciting to taste something that, that's that unusual. And uh, Alessandro made it very well. And, and yeah, that was exciting. So, yeah, I mean, one, one thing I didn't even think about in preparing for this is there are coffee competitions. There's the mm -hmm. Brewer's Cup. There's the Taster's Cup. Yeah. Barista Championships. Yep. And, and there's a Roasting, roasting Championship. Yeah. yeah, it's a little out of control. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun to, you know, having gone there, it was very fun to watch. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, as a, as a spectator, I just wanted to taste Exactly. The coffee. And that is the weakness of it, is that most of us get very frustrated to to watch it and not be able to taste it, because all you're really witnessing is the the showmanship or the routine, the, the you know, how polished someone is, how good of a performer they are, but we have no idea how the coffee tastes. And that's really what most of us care about. So it's, it's a little bit odd to to watch a competition, have everybody get judged, and actually have no idea what, what the coffee tastes like. Yeah. I mean, the, the fascinating part for me, too, was... I think last year the one I walked in on was um, the Brewers Cup, mm -hmm. and it was um, a woman named Becca from George Howell. Okay, and she did a beautiful presentation. She talked about the origin of the coffee. She talked about um, uh, you know the, the the farm that it came from, and and told um, a fascinating story. It was storytelling, mm -hmm. you know, with coffee at the sure. end. Um, she gave tasting notes that were so detailed that I wondered if people even had heard of the fruits that she was naming. <laughs> I wonder that myself sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, it was, um, you know, I wonder why, I guess I walked away wondering, hey, does Becca give that same, or even a fraction of that same thing? Not, not, I'm not picking on her. Do, no, sure. do any of the, the brewers give that same story when you come into their cafes? I, th I think they give a very abbreviated version of it often. Yeah. But also realize that, I mean, in that case, George buys very nice green coffee. Raw, green, raw coffee, we call it green coffee. So it, it's quite possible that what she used was one of his typical coffees. Most people, like my friend Alessandro, he, he brought an extraordinarily expensive coffee to the competition because essentially if you don't, you're at a disadvantage. I mean, there's many people in those comps using coffees that cost upwards of $500 a pound. And if you bring a, a really fantastic coffee that costs $20 a pound, you're, you're probably going to uh, be at a disadvantage simply because somebody else brought something so, so expensive and interesting. Yeah, I noticed that a lot of the baristas and the brewers were using coffee from, you know, one place in particular, 90 plus, mm -hmm. you know, so they, you know, yeah, they're, they they're, supply a lot of the expensive naturals that the industry yeah. buys. It's I mean, to me, it's a little bit of a problem because a lot of young baristas who want to compete, if they don't have the backing of a company that has deep pockets, they're at a little bit of a disadvantage. And it's, it's a little bit silly that people are buying such expensive coffees to practice with and compete with. I mean, there should be either some sort of limit on that or or some sort of homogenization of the coffee quality going into it because it shouldn't really be about that. It shouldn't be about how much money they're willing to spend on the green coffee for the competition. I want to dive into coffee quality a little bit, and we'll get into several different aspects of it. Um, as I hinted at in my intro, it's, it's complicated, but... Um, what I love about when I listen to you talk and I read what you write, you're, you know, all of the science that goes into this, really the goal that you have, and I would hope that any coffee consumer would have, is I just want coffee that tastes mm -hmm. great. I want to come back to 
what actually, w without getting into all the processes that go into this, um, when it comes to coffee, extracting the flavor of coffee, mm -hmm. um, honoring the bean maybe, what, what does that mean to you in terms of, you know, w when you're tasting great coffee, what, what, how would you define that to somebody who's never really given that much thought? Sure. I mean, uh, to define a great cup of coffee, obviously, there's a little subjectivity going into it. But the, the things we would look for in the industry was we would look for uh, clarity of flavor. We'd look for perhaps uh, a balance, whatever balance that is that you want. Some people like a balance that's more sour, some a little bit more bitter or whatnot. We call it sweet. It's not really actually sweet, but it's, it's sort of like has a sensation of sweetness without uh, some heavy competing flavors. Um, probably, you know, the absence of astringency, the absence of extreme bitterness, the absence of, of dirty or off flavors. Um, that's a lot of absences, but you get the idea. So <laughs> Balance is the absence of yeah. a whole bunch of things. I mean, I think the, the way to see coffee quality is that you, you start with the raw material. There's, there's the green coffee, the raw coffee, and we, we have an objective point scale for that. So it goes from zero to 100. Well, it doesn't really go to zero, but you know, it goes up to 100. And we consider roughly 80 and above to be specialty coffee. And then I would say once you're above 85, you're talking about very good coffees. And let's say Starbucks uh, buys a lot of things in low 80s. Let's say Italy uses coffees in the 70s. Um, and let's say, you know, the, the, the more well-known high-end specialty coffee companies are using mostly coffee between 85 and 90. When you go and roast it and when you extract it, you can't make it better. You basically have that 88-point ceiling or wherever the green began. And you can sort of do it justice or you could make some mistakes that take away from, from that potential. And so what your you know, ultimate cup you get is bounded by the green co coffee quality and then how did you roast it, how did you extract it? And you could argue that it's a little bit of an upstream to downstream issue where the green coffee is probably the most important factor, the roast is probably the second most important factor, and then the way you extract it is probably third. Mind you, that's arguable, but that, that's right. you know, most of us would say that. You've, you've, you've answered a future question that I was gonna ask, like where's the, the weak link or where's the, where is the most important part? So you've identified the actual right. green coffee as the most important part. Right. Roasting and then the extraction. Right. And extraction, by extraction, I think a lot of people who may not know coffee in that level of depth would think that meant um, caffeine, but we're talking about flavor. Sure. I mean, caffeine included. I mean, coffee has roughly 800 different uh, chemicals in a roasted bean. And when we talk about extraction, we're talking about removing a lot of the mostly soluble material from the ground coffee into the water. And we, we, talk, we talk about numbers related to extraction. So we talk about, say, extracting, for instance, to 20%. And we're talking about pulling about 20% of the weight of the grounds into the water. And you could think of extraction a little bit like putting a tea bag in hot water. And you want to kind of get just the right amount of extraction. You don't want to leave it in there forever because if you leave it in too long, it gets quite bitter. And if, you're, if you leave it in too, too short of a time, it's too weak. And so with coffee extraction, you're, you're both creating strength, but you're also creating flavor balance. Right. And, w and when you say 20%, like how do you measure that? So we, have, we use this thing called a refractometer. It reads refractive index of uh, light through a liquid. And so what we'll do is, I, I do this every morning at home, uh, we'll, we'll brew a cup of coffee. You weigh the coffee, and you've already weighed the grounds. And then you take a little sample out of that cup of coffee, you put a few drops on the refractometer, you push a button, and it converts the refractive index into what we call TDS, total dissolved solids. So it just tells you how strong your cup of coffee is. So for filter coffee, it would come out saying something like 1.4%. Tells you that that cup of coffee is 98.6% water, 1.4% coffee stuff, okay? And the, the amount of grounds, let's say you use 20 grams to make a cup of coffee, if you pulled 20% out, that's four grams of stuff you took out of the grounds, put it in a cup, and then at four grams, mixes it with a bunch of water and gives you this certain amount of strength. So that, that's how we define it and measure it. It's, it's a pretty common thing now. That, that trend started about 10 years ago, applying refractometers to coffee. And it's been, it's been an in incredibly useful tool because people used to just change you know the grind and the dose and the water and they, they were always playing with variables not really sure where on this sort of map of variables and flavor they were and having this hard number of the strength and then the extraction to point to uh, really helped give us a bit of a map where now we we're no longer groping in the dark we kind of play with variables with a little bit more awareness of where it's going and that's that's helped uh, a tremendous amount of progress in coffee i said there would be math
<laughs> and speaking of math and, and all the science, you know, so I just want to go back and, and say the, and add in any steps here that I might be missing. But the, the, the life cycle of a coffee, you know, obviously starts with the, the maybe the horticulture of it, the, the soil, the elevation, um, the cultivation of it, the harvesting of it, the processing of it, which you alluded to earlier, the roasting of it, the brewing of it. Of it. What have I missed? Um, yeah. I mean, pretty grind, much grinding between roasting and brewing, but that's about it. Okay. And in all of that is a lot of science, as I alluded to. There's... There's chemistry, there's microbiology, there's physics. Um, in terms of the science, in the past, I don't know, say decade, what are some of the biggest milestones or learnings that we've had? Okay. So I want to be clear that I'm not a scientist. A lot of people read my books and say, oh, you're so scientific. But it's actually not true. I'm actually, I try to be systematic, which is different than scientific. But I would say that the the things that have changed dramatically on the sciencey side of coffee is uh, awareness of how to process coffee, raw coffee, uh, more effectively, uh, more carefully. Take you know, basically have less risk, less less um, uh, variability, un- undesired flavors, variability. Okay. Right. So so the the amount of high quality green coffee that's become available is just growing every year, and that's mostly happening to what I think of as cross pollination of, of ideas. So, so many small specialty companies send their own green buyer to various origins to taste coffee. They visit mills, they visit farms. And so these people are going around the globe and get a sense of what the best practices are. Because they go to one place, they see some guy innovating with something. They're like, oh, that's an interesting idea. They go to the next place, probably in a kind of a busybody, know-it-all kind of way. They say, oh, you know, the guy over there is doing this thing with this, this special procedure and then some people would be like oh I should try that and so there's this rapid cross-pollination going on between that and, and the internet where really nothing has changed in coffee nearly as fast in the last 10-15 years as the the ideas you know kind of evolving the green processing and just as a point of clarification we're talking about specialty coffee you said above 80? Yeah, so okay. roughly speaking, above 80 on a 100-point scale, we call specialty. But we're also talking, by and large, about Arabica mm-hmm. coffee versus yeah. Robusta. I'm not sure if there's any Robustas above 80. If there are, I don't necessarily want to drink them anyway. But Robusta is an a inferior-tasting species of coffee bean. Um, Italians prize Robusta. Most of the coffee in Italy is still Robusta. And Robusta has about double the caffeine of Arabica. And Robusta oh, wow. gives a lot more crema and a lot more body. So if you're making espresso, it makes it very heavy and, and creamy. That said, the flavor is very dirty, typically. Now, there are supposedly very good Robustas. I, I've tried a few of them that were touted to be amazing. I, I wouldn't drink them personally, but I understand that there there's progress there. So I want to talk a little bit, and I know we're kind of jumping around mm-hmm. here because it's hard to dive into any of these without getting a little too nerdy. But one, of, one area of great nerdiness for you is roasting. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I talk to coffee roasters... They consider your book, um, Coffee Roaster's Companion, to be the Bible of, of roasting. So you might not be a scientist, but, you know, when I leaf through it and try to read it, and I, I don't really have any plans to roast coffee, I'm just kind of interested in it. But, man, it looks like you know physics. A little bit. I studied physics at UCLA, but I definitely forgot 99% of what I learned. (laughs) And I mean, look, if you write a book and you throw a little bit of math and a few graphs in there, people feel like, whoa, that's science. Um, But it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's just, it's just really organization of best practices and, and collecting a lot of data over many, many years. But roasting anything Mm -hmm. is, it's, what what are they, the Maillard? Maillard reaction is, is is a big part of it. Right. Yeah. But with coffee, what's different? different from well from roasting anything else oh boy um potatoes or i mean there's there's not a hell of a lot of difference between roasting coffee and various types of cooking um there's there's convection so basically coffee beans you don't necessarily want to put a bunch of coffee beans in a frying pan because if there's too much conductive heat transfer conductive meaning transferring you know by by direct contact with a hot surface it will make coffee taste very you know kind of charred or burnt or roasty and so in a roasting machine, it looks a little bit like your clothes dryer at home. There's a cylinder that tumbles, and that keeps the beans aloft, and it hopefully creates more convection than conduction. 
There's a flame under the drum, typically, that's heating it. There's other architectures, but that's the typical thing. And then there's a fan that's sucking hot air across the beans from the burner and then taking the smoke out of the system and exhausting it through a chimney, right? So um, it's it's not a lot different from convection baking. Uh, perhaps one difference is that, you know, where, whereas you might set your oven at home to 400 degrees, you wouldn't do that with a roasting machine because, well, you kind of can't. It, it, the, the air temperature in a roaster will typically rise most of the roast. And uh, just simply the patterns of heat application are a little different than most, most foods because we tend to start with a lot of heat and then lower the heat as the beans themselves get hotter. But the point of it is to concentrate the sugars. Not quite. There's no, not a okay. lot of sugar in coffee. They, they get a lot more talk than they deserve credit okay. for. Um, the point really is, so a coffee bean is made up of cellulose. So it's, it's really just a bunch of strands of cellulose crisscrossing, and they create little, little voids, little cells, and there's about a million empty cells in a, in a coffee bean. And then coating those cellulose strands is what we call the soluble solids, the stuff that you think of as coffee flavor. And it could be oils as well. And so when you're roasting, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to penetrate the cellulose. You're trying to make the cellulose more brittle and more porous because green coffee is, it's, it's not rubbery. We call it rubbery. It's not rubbery the way you think of it as, but it's a little bit tough. Like it's if you tried to chew a green bean, you wouldn't do a very good job of biting through it. If you take a roasted coffee bean and you chew it, you should be able to crack it easily with your teeth and it should shatter and it's it's a bit uh, flaky like the crust of bread. Okay, so the point of roasting really is yes to to brown the beans, yes to create an ungodly number of chemical reactions, but but in, if, if you step back, you're really looking at where we're, we're taking the cellulose, we're cooking it, we're breaking it down, we're making it more porous, and then it becomes something that when you put it in the grinder, it shatters very easily. But there is so much subtlety to that. I oh, mean, yes. when I oh, when yes. I read about things like rate of rise and first crack and right, right before second crack, I mean, that's right. there's a lot that goes into getting the timing exactly yes. right. So if you roast the same coffee bean to 410 degrees Fahrenheit in the surface and you do it in 12 minutes every time, it's going to probably taste different every time. It, the The how you get there is tremendously important and extremely subtle differences in each roast, what we call roast curve, uh, like the path of temperature uh, across those 12 minutes uh, makes makes a difference in the cup and it's obvious. So my main job is consulting and I mostly consult for roasters and we I can, I can consult for almost anyone in the world by sitting at my laptop um, at home. Don't ask me why I'm not doing it on a beach in Bali, but um, so... <laughs> I can collect roasting data from people, I can analyze their data, and I can tell them how to make their coffee taste better. And until somebody's roast curves have a certain quality to them, I'm positive that I can make their coffee taste better remotely. And then once they get to the point where the curves look great, then I can taste the coffee and I can give more precise advice past there. Hmm. So those roast curves, that roast data is is incredibly insightful as far as how the coffee's going to taste. And for anybody who's curious, I mean, these these big roasting drums have sensors in them, temperature sensors, the best ones have multiple of them. Yeah. I imagine, and that feeds software, specialized software that kind of charts. And when he's when Scott's talking about roast curves, I mean, literally, it's a, it's curves on you know it's it's plots on a mm -hmm. on a graph. Um, right. And that roasting software that may seem a little bit too detailed for most people, but really, the advent of software to track roasting temperatures over the last ten years has been a revolution in roasting. Before that, we were basically cavemen. Uh, <laughs> pulling on a, a lever and cranking a shaft and just hoping that something happened properly. And I mean, so so we've had, in the last 10 years, we've had this cross-pollination of ideas at the farm and mill level. We've had software and roasting, which is allowing us to track data that we, we never had any access to before. And then we've had the refractometer and, and things like that that are helping us track brewing. So there's been a little bit of a revolution in coffee in the last 10 years as far as data and ideas sharing and cross-pollination of best practices, which is one of the big reasons why coffee is tasting so different than it did 10 or 15 years ago. A couple of the other areas I just want to touch on is um, grind and quality of water. This is something that people kind of, these are things that people may not realize are, are also mm -hmm. important when you get to that extraction and brewing level. Mm -hmm. So grind is, is critical. And if you're making coffee at home, probably the weak link in your system is your grinder. So low quality grinding can really get in the way of, of coffee brewing, can really get in the way of flavor. Um, fortunately, it costs usually quite a bit of money to get it in a really nice grinder. So that your 20 or $30 little propeller grinder is not going to cut it. Ah, no, no pun intended. And I mean, there's there's 
grinders that cost a couple hundred dollars, like like the ones made by Barasa and other companies that are really good for home. And and they really do grind just about as well as many professional grinders do. It's just that they're not designed to handle a few hundred pounds a day, but if you're just making a few cups at home every day, they're fantastic. And that's if you're gonna invest in anything, invest in the grinder. The grinder is more important than the brewer or the espresso machine in terms of cup quality. Same thing in a coffee bar. And what about the water? So <clears throat> I have to introduce a little bit of terminology. So for the average consumer, I think they think if their water tastes good, that it's good for making coffee, but that's not necessarily true. So there's something called TDS, which is total dissolved solids, which is just a measure of all the stuff dissolved in your water. And so our, arguably your TDS for coffee should be about 100 to 150 parts per million. Then you have pH, which people are familiar with vaguely from chemistry class, potential hydrogen, and roughly seven, which is neutral, is, is good. Anything around there is good. But then, then we get into the more detailed stuff that's actually pretty important. There's hardness and there's alkalinity. So hardness is a quality created by calcium and magnesium and other, anion, uh, other ions. And alkalinity is created by things like bicarbonate. Um, and so it's the alkalinity that drives coffee flavor. And what I mean by that is that when alkalinity is very high, like if it has a lot of bicarb, coffee will be very flat. So even if the coffee was roasted light and has a lot of acidity, use really high alkalinity water to make your cup of coffee and it's gonna be flatter. It's gonna be kind of chalky. Likewise, if alkalinity is very low, coffee is gonna be a little bit more forward and aggressive in the cup as far as acidity and such. So getting the alkalinity right is, is definitely the most important part, although most people just think of the TDS number and forget the rest. So if you go to the grocery store and you look at a bunch of different bottled waters, most of them have numbers in the label. The ones that don't, you can find them online. And if you can find water that's got the alkalinity in the right range, um, that's pretty good. And if you can only find ones that are high, you could also buy distilled water and you can cut the two waters together. So let's say you found something with an alkalinity of 90 hmm. and your target is 45. Well, go buy some distilled water, do 50-50, and now you've got 45. Gotcha. And it's, it's kind of, um, well, let's talk about brew methods for a mm -hmm. second too. And you're a big, you know, a lot of people think the pour overs are the way to go, but you're You've you've been very vocal about batch brewing, right? Um, at least in right. modified quantities being being better. So let's just right. touch on brewing for a moment. Right. So I started uh, owning coffee bars 25 years ago, and I've always been a proponent of batch brewing, uh, partly because, as we know, you know, it is convenient. That's nice, um, and it's practical. But also, it does make delicious coffee. Now. The reason most people don't think that batch brew does make delicious coffee is because unfortunately when you go to the gas station, when you go to Dunkin' Donuts, where you go wherever, that batch brew may be sitting around for an hour or two hours and the coffee flavor could be really compromised by that. So they get that sort of stale, bitter, sour experience and they think, oh, batch brew sucks. But it's not the batch brew's fault. It's the people managing the batch brew situation's fault. And I took a lot of heat in specialty coffee for many years because I was a proponent of batch brew during the during the five to eight year trend when when the only thing that mattered is pour overs. You know, your barista had to stand there, take freaking five minutes to make your cup of coffee, overcharge you for it. It wasn't very good, but that, that magical performance was everything in specialty coffee. And that really kind of ticked me off because everyone was following a trend. No one was actually objectively saying, you know what, that didn't taste very good. And by the way, I don't like waking, waiting six minutes for an overpriced cup of coffee. <laughs> and Batch Brew actually does a better job than hand pours typically. So, Thankfully, batch brew has become popular again. Um, part of it, I had this cafe in Montreal about, uh, maybe we started about 11 years ago. And that place became pretty rapidly known as the best cafe in Canada within a year. And we were slamming busy and we were basically, I had spent years not in the coffee business, just collecting ideas. And then when I opened a cafe and just implemented all these ideas and just, it was like somebody came in and just did something that nobody had ever done before. We're using equipment no one had ever used. We used methods people had never used. Famous baristas from around the world would come in and they'd say, oh my, like I, you know, they, they were really amazed by the extraction quality and such. And because the internet was starting to boom at that time, everything we were doing was sort of broadcast on the internet. And then suddenly I'm seeing some barista in Singapore copy my idea mm -hmm. like two days later. And that, that's, that batch brew was a big part of that. Like we were doing little two liter batch brews and we were literally serving 500 cups of batch brew a day out of this place no bigger than this room. It was a tiny cafe. And being able to do that and turn it over meant that most people were getting a batch brew that was made 15 minutes or less ago. And so they're having a great experience in terms of quality and freshness. And then that kind of made it okay to do batch brew and then other, other companies slowly caught on. Uh, can we touch on coffee regions for me? It's too, sure. too, too many to talk about. But I, so, you know, coffee 
you know, originated in countries like Ethiopia, Yemen. We have coffees in Central America, South America, um, all over the world. But do you have favorites? Sure. Um, definitely Kenya. I'm a huge fan of Kenya, sometimes Ethiopia. So East African coffees tend to be the most acidic in the world. And acidity is not a bad thing in coffee. Acidity is a, is a quality that you can expose or or suppress a little bit, but having the the potential acidity is great because it's something you can work with. And acidity is what gives coffee its sparkle, its life, its fruitiness, its its snap. And so having something very low acidity, a lot of consumers like low acidity, but it can be quite boring to a professional. So Kenyas tend to be the most acidic coffees. Ethiopians are, are close behind. Um, there are some wonderful coffees from Colombia and Central America. Um, there's quite a bit of coffee now, for better or for worse, being grown in places like Vietnam, where they've they've chosen to grow mostly robusta, and they 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 destroyed the world market price years ago because they came on stream and were almost instantly the second largest grower in the world. So you can imagine how disruptive that was to supply and demand for one country to just boom into number two on the market in no time. So um, you know each each region has its own qualities. How you process the coffee really influences it too. I would say most professionals are, are huge fans of Kenya and Ethiopia, and uh, you know a handful of central origins. Okay. It's, we're we're, get, we're getting into the weeds of things, and we're going to come back to the production side in a minute. But I want to talk about your journey in coffee a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I, as I understand it, you you got your start almost in a way by accident, <laughs> escaping or avoiding roommates while you were at UCLA. <laughs> so I went to UCLA on campus. There, there's a there's a place called Kirkhoff Coffee House. It's this lovely stained glass window cafe with absolutely dreadful coffee. And I just had a living situation one year that was a little bit too crowded and unpleasant. And I just, the, the coffee shop was open till 1 a.m. So I basically went there to study till 1 a.m., kind of formed a nice community of friends there, and it became kind of a second home. If I could have slept there, I would have. <laughs> and um, even though the coffee was terrible, I loved coffee houses. I just, I loved what, you know, that, that vibe, that sense of community. And then I, I always knew I was going to open restaurants. That was sort of my destiny from a young age. And... I didn't like coffee, and I, I was kind of into coffee houses, and I thought, oh, I'd really love to open a coffee shop, but I don't like coffees. That <laughs> probably won't work very well. But then this place opened a couple blocks away from where I lived called City Bean in Westwood. Um, this was probably in 1992 or so. And my boss, the place I was working, brought me a cup of coffee. I didn't usually drink coffee, but I was quite tired, so I had a little, and I thought, my God, I, I didn't know I could like coffee. Like Every coffee I'd had up to them was vile, and it probably was. And so I took a break. I went down to the, the coffee shop and I got another one and met the owner, James, who's still a good friend. And it was kind of a funny moment because I said, that was the first good cup of coffee of my life. I want the same thing again. And he said, oh, sorry, we just changed from Java to Sumatra. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, 21 years and, you know, I can't have that again, you know. <laughs> and and, uh, and he, he laughed and he gave me a, a free cup of coffee and said, here, just, you know, this, this one's on me. And I tasted it and it was it was good. Um, you know, probably not not great by my standards today, but because it was a Sumatra, which I'm not in love with. But it was they were really masters of what they were doing back then compared to everybody else. And they were really the best at the time. And I was just very fortunate and lucky to be down the block from one of the few places in the country that really knew what they were doing. And James kind of took me under his wing, became a bit of a mentor. And then I very naively decided to uh, strike out and find a place to put a coffee shop and find money <laughs> as if it's just sitting around <laughs> waiting. And so I got in my car. I didn't, want to open a, I didn't want to open a cafe in LA. I drove around the country. I decided to look at all the major university towns because they tend to be busy and, and good for coffee shops, but not too expensive. And I said, I didn't have a lot of money. I mean, I had five figures to work with to open a coffee shop and a roastery. And I, I was also kind of pitching my idea to people. And I found a family friend who was interested in investing. And then that kind of got some of my family interested. And I, I collected some money. I maxed out my credit card uh, cards and took up my life savings, which wasn't much. And I ended up, um, well, before I got to Amherst, Massachusetts, I went to, this is actually a great moment. Um, I went to Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And I thought I was going to open it there until I saw like the last business in the little college downtown area was this amazing coffee shop. And I walked in and it was, it was like someone uh, cracked into my mind, saw the image of my shop and just put it there because everything about it was identical to what I wanted to do. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, like someone did exactly this. You know, it was a little bit, of, we were a little bit ahead of our time. And I asked to meet the owner and this really curmudgeonly middle-aged guy, which is, I guess, what I am now, this curmudgeonly <laughs> middle-aged guy. He, he comes out, he says, yeah, what do you want? And I said, well, I was living in LA. I had this idea. I was going to do a coffee shop like this, this, this. I drove to Boulder and I drove to you know, Ann Arbor and all these places. And 
I thought this would be the perfect place to do it, but you're here first. And his whole demeanor changed. And he said, really? And I said, yeah. He says, me too. I said, what do you mean, me too? He says, no, I lived in California. I went the exact same route you did, wow. a year and a half ahead of you to do the exact same thing. And I ended up here. And I said, okay, okay, great. I said, my... If you weren't here, I would do it. But since you're here, my number two is College Park, Maryland. And he yeah. said, oh. He said, oh. Sorry. Did you, did you go there? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> he said, oh, that was my number three. And I said, my God, what's your number two? Because I am opening a coffee shop in your number two. Like, obviously, we, we totally understand each other. He said, Amherst, Massachusetts. So I said, okay. Got in my car. Day and a half later, I'm in Amherst. And I'm looking around thinking, it's a cute place. It's charming. There's five coffee shops, but they're all pretty terrible. There's only one traffic light. It's not a big place, right? But there's five colleges in the area, and there's another 30,000 residents. And there's this pizza place in Amherst. I don't know if you've ever been to Amherst. I have not. There is, this, this town has two blocks, right? But there is a pizza place, probably 1,000 square feet. This is, this is no joke. This is 1994. They were doing $10,000 a day selling nothing but cups of soda and slices of pizza, nothing else on the menu. They had like 15 kinds of pizza. They kept making them and then they just pop them in the oven and you ordered one and then two seconds later, your pizza's out there. 10,000, in today's money, that's over $20,000 a day. That's like $8 million a year in today's money owning a pizza shop a thousand square feet. I've, I mean, I grew up in New York City. I've never seen a pizza place like this. Huh. Unbelievable. From the moment they open until 1 a.m. when all the bars let out and the kids go there, it's, 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 it was, but it was one of those things I saw that and I said, well, there's five coffee shops here. They're not very good. They're not very busy. But if Antonio's can do $10,000 a day, I can make money selling coffee here. I found a location, spare you that story, opened up there in a kind of like what felt like an iffy location, but it, but it was good enough and it kind of boomed. And, you know, a few years later, we're doing well over a thousand people a day. And, and we were sort of ahead of our time in many ways. Starbucks came in down the street in my fifth year. They plopped themselves very unceremoniously right in front of me. And the guy who was their sort of regional guy walks up to me, and I, we'd met once before, and, and he said, oh, you know, we just, you know, I, I said, I thought, I thought you said Amherst is too small for you. They're like, yeah, you know, we think, we think there's enough room for both of us. And I was like, no, actually, there's not. I was like, you will never make money here. Like, <laughs> I, I was just, you know, I was livid. I'm like, don't, don't BS me, you know? And I'm, I'm proud to say that even, even a couple of years later when I eventually sold my business, we still did more than triple Starbucks volume. They, while I was there, they never cracked $1,000 a day. And they basically, you know, they lost money there. And they're actually this year, they're, they're finally leaving that location. Like they finally, <laughs> they finally got profitable years after I left because my place was sort of neglected for a little while. But um, yeah, we had, a, we had a very special place there. Wow. We interrupt this Girl Wire podcast episode for a word from our sponsors over at Blue Mics. Just like Scott Rayo's incredible journey with coffee, everyone has a story to tell. If you're a storyteller, you probably know Blue Mics for their iconic Yeti microphone, which has helped millions of people find and amplify their voices. Now, if you're thinking about creating your own podcast, recording some voiceovers, gaming, maybe reading audiobooks or whatever, then you need to check out Blue's new Yeti Caster. This is the complete mic and boom arm system that's ready to connect to your laptop and bring the ultimate broadcast studio setup to your home or office. Now that's what we're using here at the Growwire Santa Monica Studios, and we love them. I especially love that when I lick them during the podcast, they taste like coffee. Yes, Kendall? But it tastes so good. Fritz? They don't have a coffee mm. flavor. Well, for those tuning in right now, I'm the producer of this podcast. Fritz can get your hands to on one of these, these setups in front of minus our, the flavor. In front of our guests, and I wonder if that's, you know, if that's and use the why code they won't come podcast, back. Podcast at checkout it's, for a special it's price. It's not flavored. They're not flavored. Maybe in the future. <laughs> so, I mean, back in those days, what what was it that that made this so special? And then was even able to that's keep podcast, Starbucks from not pod couch. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's so another futuristic. I think in our heads, usually idea we feel coming like to you soon. There's a trade off. I could go to the little mom and pop place and get a cozy experience or, or some sort of quality orientation, or I can go to the the chain and get consistency or, or efficiency or something like that. But I think uh, coffee chains are actually not that good, not that efficient, and such. It's just they just seem like they're efficient because most of the mom and pops are kind of falling apart. But I just felt like most businesses I go to, I feel like they care about one or two things, but they don't care about the whole thing. 
how many businesses you know they really care about the service they really care about the atmosphere they really care about quality and efficiency the whole package right it's a lot it's a lot to worry about sure. And I obsessed over all of it. And I probably lost 10 or 20 years of my life doing this because it was very stressful. But I feel like we really cared about the customers. We really cared about the coffee. We were on a mission. I mean, one of my staff said to me not that long ago recently, she's like, you know, we felt like we were on a mission to wake the world's best cup of coffee. And I don't know if we did or not, but it's like everyone came to work super motivated for that. And I was like, yeah, and you know, and, and we worked hard. I mean, in today's dollars, no joke, my baristas were on average making $25 an hour. Wow. But I was a brutal boss, not in terms of meanness, in terms of we worked our ass off, myself included. I, I, would, I would work 15 hours straight, no problem. I was in my 20s. I, you know, I, I lost 30 pounds the first year I had my coffee shop because I just, I was just, for, I would forget to eat some days because I was just working so hard. And I think that rubbed off on everyone because no one wants to see their boss stressing and sweating so hard and, and trying to make a go of something. You know, they don't want to just stand around and watch like people, they're motivated. They're like, wow, we're, we're going to do this. And, uh, and it showed. I mean, I still, when I go back to Amherst to visit, people still stop me in the street and be like, that staff you had in the 90s, they were amazing, you know, and it, it's it's a funny thing, but it, it really, there was there was some soul there. There was some, there was a level of care you don't see very often in businesses. And when I find it, very rarely when I find it, I will tell the entire world about it. Like I'll, you know, I don't I don't promote people for money or anything like that, but when I, when I get treated really well in a place where they care and they do a good job, it's like, I feel like it's my mission to tell 100 people, hmm. you know, so... But I feel like most businesses are a little lazier than that. Most businesses are like, yeah, you know, we got this nice branding going on. We're, you know, they're, they're looking at a spreadsheet more than they're looking at the customer thinking like, what does that customer really want? You know, we have the kind of place where dozens of people met their future spouse there. You know, many dozens of people wrote their dissertation there. Hmm. People used to come in and tell me, you know, I would just, I would always come here on a bad day because I knew I'd be happier. And, you know, I feel like it was personal, but it was also extreme quality. And that's, that's rare. So you touched every single aspect. I of, tried really hard. I'm yeah. sure I'm sure in many ways I failed and in many ways I could have done better. I think we rushed through things sometimes too much. Like we had a sense of urgency, but also we were a little chaotic. But at the same time, you know, sometimes those chaotic restaurant and cafe type places are the places with all the buzz. So there, there was this guy. This wasn't the story I meant to tell you, but there's, there's this guy. We call him the Snake Man. And this guy one day came into the cafe. Um, well, actually, before he came in, this employee I had named Josh says to me, oh, this guy came in and he he crawled on the floor, bare chested, and then he walked out the cafe. And I was like, "Yeah, whatever, Josh." Like Josh always liked to exaggerate, and he, he called the he dubbed the guy the Snake Man, right? <clears throat> then one day on a super busy Saturday afternoon, literally line out the door. Sure enough, I'm making coffee, and I see this guy, shirts open, you know, chest is showing. He gets on the floor. He he, he slithers on the floor, not even hands and, and knees, you know. And then he gets up to the pastry case. He kisses the glass. He, he stands up, he turns around, he gets back in his stomach, and he crawls out the door. And I'm like, what? I've never seen anything like this in a, in a place. So I, I hand the espresso machine to someone. I say, hold on. And I, I go to the door, and I, I'm standing in the doorway, and this guy stands up. He turns around as if he's going to come back in the cafe. And he looks up at me, and I look down at him, and I just shook my head. I just, no. You know, because, because it was, you know, he was bumping into people in line. Someone was going to trip, spill a hot coffee or whatnot. And he shrugged his shoulders, and he started walking away. And I was like, I, I was like, I gotta talk to this guy. I mean, this is, you know, how you, when you meet someone like this, you gotta talk to him. So I said, I said, hey. And he turned around. And I said, why, are you, why are you doing that? Why, why are you crawling on the ground? He took a really like minutes to answer. He just stared at me. He just took minutes, and he said, it's something I need to do to survive. And I was like, that was a good answer, right? And he just <laughs> walked away. I had, I had no response, right? He started coming in more and more. This guy. So we called him the Snake Man. He started coming. And every, every once in a while, I'd come in and I'd get a little piece of his story, right? But then one day, my buddy Brandt, who owned a place called Small World Coffee in Princeton, New Jersey, which at the time was absolutely the busiest coffee shop in, in America. Like, maybe there were some Starbucks that were busier, but as far as non-chains, they were the busiest. We were the second busiest that I was aware of. So both places had a lot of buzz. Brandt wanted to buy a roasting machine. I invited him to come, come up and inspect my machine, check it out. So we were sitting watching the roaster for a while. Got a little boring. So I was like, hey, let's trade crazy customer stories. Because believe me, we have crazy customer stories. And he started talking about, you no, know, so I started talking about this guy. You know, bare chested, blah, blah, blah. And Brandt says, oh, that's Bill. I said, what do you mean it's Bill? He says, oh, he lives in Princeton. I said, what do you mean? He says, oh, he comes to our cafe all the time. It's got to be. He's like, he's like olive skin, 40 years old. I said, yeah. And he's like, oh, his dad was part of the Manhattan Project. And like this, you know, crazy, you know, physicist. And Bill's like kind of a savant, but kind of a little bit schizophrenic and crazy. And sure enough, like he crawls around on his stomach all over town in Princeton. And I was like, wow, OK, so Bill likes... Bill likes the two busiest coffee shops in the country. There's something to that, right? <laughs> so I see Bill the next day. 
And he, he called me Rao. He called me Chairman Rao. He thought it was funny, like a take on Chairman Mao. I don't know why he thought this was funny. And, he, and I walk up to him and I was like, Bill, I got to ask you something. He's like, I got to ask you something, Rao. And I said, okay. And he said, what were those guys from Small World Coffee doing here in Amherst? Like, are they following me? What are they doing? And I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, they're friends of mine. What are you doing here? Like, let's get this story right. And he wouldn't answer me. But over time, I pieced together that Bill felt like he was on a mission to clean the ground. He couldn't stand the trash and dirt on the ground. He would actually, you know, years later, he would grab, he would go to the back of my cafe, walk in the back door, grab the broom and, and, and a trash bin and go around town and use them to clean up. Meanwhile, we're wondering what, where the hell our broom <laughs> and trash bin are. And sure enough, like Bill had it in the middle of the street. And... So I asked him, I said, okay, so if you like to crawl around Small World Coffee in my place, where else do you like to do this? And Bill started rattling off what I thought were the best, busiest coffee shops in the country. He doesn't drink coffee, mind you, <laughs> but he he found the places with this certain energy that he just totally fed on. And he, he would literally, he gets a check every two weeks from a trust fund. He would usually give the money away. He'd put it in tip jars and stuff like that and give it to people who give him free food and stuff. He would take money and get on a bus and he'd go to some other town to go crawl around and clean the ground. And he would go, he'd kind of go based on where the coffee shops were that he liked. So anyway, there are many Bill stories, as you can imagine, oh. but um, fascinating. fascinating. Wow. Yeah. That is, that is one yeah. of the best stories I've heard yeah. this year, I so think. So I want to tell you an abbreviated version of what I think like the most significant story of my life related to why that shop was special. So when I got to this town, it was the kind of town, imagine, imagine a movie where outsiders are not welcome in this small town. And I moved there with a girlfriend, and we'd been together many years. And after we were there a few weeks, people just kept, we weren't very busy yet, and people kept coming in the morning and just kind of clearly weren't customers. They were just being busybodies. And they say, why, well, why'd you come to our town? Why, you know, don't you know that all the businesses before you in this space failed? And like, why do you think we want you? And, and stuff like that, like really, really unwelcoming things. And my girlfriend at the time, she was like, we moved to the Twilight Zone. This is a horrible place. We were so miserable to be in this town where people were telling us to get out, basically. And then this thing happened where we started roasting coffee and there was this building behind my cafe where it was subsidized housing for elderly and handicapped people. And there were these three old people who started complaining to the town about the smell of the roasting. And I, I don't begrudge them for that. Like, I don't think it smells good. And I, I tried to clean it up. And the health inspector came to the back door of my cafe, veins bulging in his neck, face red, yelling at me, telling me, you know, if, if, if I don't fix this problem, he's shutting down my business. So, I mean, I'm 22 years old. I'm in $100,000 worth of debt. I'm working my ass off. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to lose my business. And these people kept calling me on the phone. And, and I'd say, okay, well, what's your complaint? And how can I help you? And, and I'm trying to fix this. But would you like me to roast at night? Would you like me? And they would just hang up the phone. And, and nobody would ever engage or talk. So one day, one of the old people comes to my cafe at night. It's like Thursday night at 9 o'clock. He says, oh, I thought you might like to know they're having a meeting about you in the basement of the community center. And I was like, oh, boy, this is one of those moments that you feel like a little bit uncomfortable. And it's like the movie where you say, no, 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 don't go. Don't go. You know, the bad guy's in that closet, right? And so I go to this meeting. I never get to finish the sentence. These people, they, they shut me down. They insult me personally. They lie to me about the town's power to shut down my business. The town, instead of being a mediator, took the side of the other people. And I literally walked out of there thinking I lost my business. Didn't sleep that night. 901 comes around. I get on the phone. I call my friend's dad, who's an attorney, and I say, look, this happened to me last night. And he says, look, I, I know you're stressed, but don't worry. They can't. It's not so simple. There's a due process. They can't just shut you down like that. And I felt a little better. <clears throat> so anyway, they denied that meeting ever happened. Literally, they said, what meeting? What are you talking about? And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, these, you know, these people, right? And they were, they were very under, underhanded, extremely so. They were like the bad guys in that movie in the town in the South where, you know, anyway. So... The official version of the meeting that ever happened comes around. And so I'm like, all right, this time I'm going armed, right? I got the attorney. I got an air quality, like an industrial pollution air quality expert. And one of my customers comes in and says to me, look, I've seen these, I've seen these people haze new businesses before, and they hate the businesses that cater students. This is what you're going to do. And she's like, write a letter, give it to all the townie customers, none of the students. And she kind of twisted my arm, and I was like, okay, I felt a little uncomfortable doing it, but I did it. I handed out like 300 of these letters. The night of the meeting comes around. My mom comes up from New York. The, my, my attorney's there. The press is there. The air quality expert's there. And 300 people show oh. up, right? So the Board of Health and these three complainers are there. These people are livid. They come to my cafe that afternoon and tell me they made a decision unilaterally that either myself or my attorney could talk, but not both of us. And I was like, I was like, fine, I'll let my attorney talk, right? But, but then they were like, oh, and the public can't talk. And I was like, look, 
look, you shut up the public. I'm not going to tell the public not to talk, right? <laughs> what are you talking about? So we had to make the resolution about how to fix the roasting problem. I'd already spent $30,000 on some machinery to fix it. It, wasn't, it helped, but it wasn't quite good enough. And I, I said I would keep fixing it. And the meeting comes around, and it felt like that courtroom scene in a movie where there's going to be a brawl if it doesn't go our way. And the three complainers got kicked out because they, they kept yelling and talking out of turn. And then the, the town board was clearly intimidated by, by the room. It was palpable, the, the, the like anger in the room. Ultimately, they kind of ruled my way, and I, I fixed the problem, and it all kind of went away. But it was, uh, you know, going through an experience like that, thinking the town hated me, and then having three pe- 300 people show up, touch my shoulder, and say, don't worry, those people aren't getting out of here till we, we protect your business. And that sort of bond between the town and myself, the customers and myself, like, you can understand that there was something special going on there in terms of they weren't doing it because they loved coffee. They were doing it because they've seen this before in that town. And the fact that they did that for me meant so much to me. I felt like these people are now my family. And, you know, those those became my regulars for, you know, seven years. And wow. really the only reason I sold the business was that I just – I never felt comfortable in that town. I always felt a little bit – like looking over my shoulder, I just felt a little uncomfortable with, with all of that. And it kind of never went away. Um, but it was, it was amazing having all these people who were kind of haters and, and – kind of underhanded and then all these other people who like you know skip dinner at home to show up to protect yeah. this stranger with the new business that's so great. it was a really epic thing so sorry to go way off track no but that that's was, that's you know. great and you you answered like three of my other questions <laughs> so you know i was going to ask you why you left but now i know and what then you went to new zealand um yeah went to new zealand got exposed to in, in some ways, at the time, New Zealand was kind of ahead in coffee. There, New Zealand and Australia had an espresso culture that was a little different than the U.S., a little more efficient, a little more uh, you know, kind of milk drink, small milk drink, quality focused, uh, limited menus. And um, it, it was a good perspective for me to, to have to spend time there. Like it really kind of reoriented me. I ended up getting dragged back to the U.S. to open this sort of restaurant, cafe, coffee roastery with a friend. Did that. It was it was let's just say it was hard working together and and that didn't work out so well between us. The place is kind of an institution now, but I, eventually I left, um, didn't stay that, that, that long. I stayed a little over a year. And then around that time, I just had a lot of time in my hands and I thought somebody needed to write a book about how to make coffee because it really didn't exist, at least not to my satisfaction. And so I wrote one just thinking it was kind of a service to the industry. And then that the book did well. And then uh, people started ringing me up, asking me questions, and ultimately I realized that I could write books and do some consulting. That was Professional Barista's Handbook? Yeah, that was the first book. Yeah, that was 2008. And then along the way, I ended up opening a cafe with a partner in Montreal. Cafe Myriad? Cafe Myriad. Um, I was there for four years. Uh, There was some issues with theft and some serious things going on there that kind of shattered that partnership. Um, Myriad's still there. Um, And then... You know, I kept writing, kept consulting, and uh, ultimately, you know, I've, I've gotten involved in a small way with, with several businesses, but mostly stayed kind of independent as a consultant and author and giving seminars and all. You just opened with some partners, the Canadian Roasting Society? Yeah, so it's, it's a new place. I'm really happy to be back in Montreal. I mean, I, I was disappointed with what went down with my cafe financially and personally, but also I, I loved Montreal, and I loved having an excuse to spend a lot of time there. And... Uh, this guy, Andy, who owned a place called Tunnel Espresso that I, I knew him from back in the days when I lived in Montreal. Um, he really wanted to do what we call a co-roasting facility. So you can imagine having a handful of roasting machines. Most roasting machines are sitting idle most of the time. And it's a little bit like a timeshare where lots of small companies could rent a few hours a week on the machine instead of going and buying their own equipment and replicating it. Right. So so instead of having 10 companies go out and spend a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars each and then pay three to four thousand dollars a month in rent. They all can basically do it for a fraction of the price uh, using our equipment. And so it's a little bit of a community there. We've got maybe 12 or 15 companies roasting there. And, you know, they share information. They taste each other's coffee. They probably socialize more than they should because they're at work. But it's a fun it's a fun place. And we supply all the equipment necessary for them to roast the coffee, package their coffee, et cetera. And you know, it's, an, it's a nice business model. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was struck in one of my favorite uh, cafes in my uh, hometown is uh, Rose Park, and they were oh, sure. they were roasting at uh, Keen's Coffee, which mm-hmm. is the Diedrich family. Right, Martin Diedrich. Yeah, um, which makes one of the uh, preeminent right. roaster. Right. So Martin's brother Stephen started Diedrich Coffee Roasters, the manufacturer. He sold it, I believe, two years ago to some other folks, but Martin still owns uh, Keen. He's got yeah. a couple locations in Orange County. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you, so you, 
been consulting, spending a lot of time consulting, and also working um, on the equipment side yes. with um, Litmus. Uh, <clears throat> right, Litmus Coffee Labs. Coffee and Labs. And I also you. work with a company called Decent, Decent. Espresso. Yeah. So Litmus, uh, my buddy Dan Isles and I, um, we decided we wanted to take on some some projects, building equipment, and and just to kind of pay the bills and, and get things moving. We ended up buying some three D printers to to prototype some parts, and we started manufacturing some small spray heads because there's a lot of really nice batch brewer machines out there that you know cost a couple thousand dollars. They do a good job, but the spray head itself is really inhibiting quality. It's a little bit like putting a twenty five dollar tire on a Ferrari, where a lot of the potential is lost right there at the last step. And so we we made better spray heads for a few machines out there, and that's going quite well. Um, and I work with a company called Decent Espresso, which is John Buckman, who owns Decent, is one of the world's geniuses. He, um, the guy's the guy's an amazing, amazing coder, and he he's run some software companies, and then he got really into coffee. He bought a defunct um, Kickstarter that had been building an espresso machine, and he took that as a foundation, and he basically gutted the old espresso machine architecture, and there's just a tiny boiler in our machine, but the machine has, I think, 11 or 13 sensors in it, and there's a little Android tablet on top. Hmm. And so we've kind of replaced the old heavy architecture of an espresso machine with a bunch of software and sensors. And the machine can control and track what's going on in Espresso like no other machine has before. It sounds unnecessary, it sounds ridiculous, but it's actually one of those new revolutionary things that's completely changing our understanding of, of Espresso. And it's amazingly fun. I have one at home and I, I use it every day and I, I really never enjoyed making Espresso in the past because I feel like you push a button, you watch it flow. You don't really know what's going on. It's not. There's not very much interaction or, or learning, mm -hmm. but the, every day on the decent, I'm learning, and it's it's fascinating what the machine can do. And it's if if I understand and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean as as higher end home espresso machines, it's mm -hmm. fairly affordable. I mean, yes, it's a, it's in the three thousand dollar range, right. which sounds like a lot, but there's many machines that are less capable and far more money. Um, you know, you can buy a thousand dollar machine for home, sure. Um, you know, realistically, you should put a fair amount of your home budget to a good grinder. Make sure a grinder can go not only grind well, but grind fine enough for a good espresso. But you know, if you if you can afford it, the decent is is it's a fun, really interesting machine to use. So I wanted I want to talk next a little, just a little bit about some of the new innovation mm -hmm. that's happening, um, and I feel like we've covered it a little bit here. The the data, mm -hmm. you know. So so you just talked about decent and and the fact that he yeah. that you're getting data now and right. and you're you're a big data guy, I would I would say yes. you've talked about big data. You've talked about um, being able to, um, you know, obviously balance what you're tasting with mm -hmm. what the data says. Yeah. Um, is there more innovation going on in that area right now? Do you think that's the next? big frontier. I mean, we're there. It's always hard to predict the future and it's always tempting to just take a current trend and just say, well, this is this is the future, but you know, it's, the, it's really the present. I mean, we have amazing data collection that we didn't have 10 years ago uh, in, in roasting, in probably even in agronomy, but in espresso certainly. And um, we're learning so much. There's really this kind of renaissance of learning in coffee because we just, all we could do before was pull a bunch of levers, taste the coffee, and sort of assume we knew what the connection was. But now we're seeing with a, a scary level of precision what's going on. Um, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what the future is. I mean, there's definitely more data coming and there's definitely a little bit of a rethink about a lot of equipment, both because of what software can do, but also because the old mentality, the Italian mentality, is a little bit like a 1960s American muscle car. It's like heavier is better, bigger engines better. Especially machines that, you know, companies used to brag about how heavy their group heads were. Oh, our group heads 11 pounds. Well, you know what? 11 pounds is not good because 11 pounds when it gets, it's like a cast iron pan at home. When it gets too hot, now you got a really heavy pan that's hot. It's like it takes a long time to yeah. cool down. Like it's not very nimble. And so you, if you're looking for flexibility and if you're looking for agility, what you actually want is as little thermal mass as possible in your espresso group head. And the same thing applies to roasting machines. Same thing applies to most of this equipment where heavy metal, when it's a little bit off in temperature, it stays off. And so we're, we're learning a lot about, you know, how to make things a little bit lighter, more nimble, using the data to, to you know, kind of gel our, our understanding of all these things. And there's this sort of virtuous cycle going on. We've I've kind of stayed away from the topic of um, processing until now mm -hmm. um, because we've gotten, as you have said earlier, to the point of having better and better green coffee mm -hmm. um we haven't touched on processing but i want to save that for now to 
Well, let's touch on that, and then I'll I'll get to the innovation part in a minute. But um, so you mentioned you don't like naturals, <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're they're really two main ways of processing coffee, washed and natural. But there's some kind of, a lot of, sub- a lot of hybrids now, a lot yeah. of gray areas, a lot of a lot of cross pollination of, of honey, methods. different yeah. black honey, sure. w- white honey. Um, all of those have an effect on the way sure. the coffee tastes, assuming you've roasted it well and you've brewed right. it well. Right. So I, I want to preempt this by saying I'm absolutely not an expert on processing. I really am not. Right. I, I avoid talking about it too much because it just makes me sound stupid. Um, I love to stick to what I know and, and I, you know, that kind of thing. So <clears throat> the natural process, it's it's very popular with consumers because – for the average consumer, the first time they taste the natural and they taste blueberry in a coffee, the blueberry kind of hits them over the head and it's like, wow, I taste blueberry in coffee. And it's a revolutionary experience for them, right? Happened to me. Right. <laughs> and it's happened to all of us. And it's, it's great. Um, arguably, as a professional with decades in the, in the industry, eventually you kind of get tired of hit, getting hit over the head with blueberries and you want something a little more subtle. So to each his own. Uh, if you like naturals, that's, that's, that's great. That's fine. Um, there's not much of an argument in terms of the natural process tends to be very heavy handed in the sense that the wash process really lets the terroir shine through. The natural process is is very much influenced by the process. The cup is very influenced by the processing. So you could take it to an extreme and say all naturals kind of taste the same. Not true, but you get the idea that yeah. it, it's they all have this sort of characteristic, this sort of strawberry rhubarb kind of heavy uh, fermenty fruit thing happening. And... That's that's great for consumers. It's great for getting people interested in sort of fruity coffee. It's not that interesting ultimately. And and just for the sake of those listeners who may not know, I mean, the natural process, the coffee comes in a fruit, looks a lot like a cherry. Um, it is dried almost entirely in the sun. Right. And so that fermentation that's happening there is a lot different than the wash process where a machine will – literally wash the cherry off the coffee and there's some bit of fermentation that's still happening but it's a much different yeah. level that, that than the natural you know, the arguably the amount of time that the fruit is sitting out in the sun in the natural process it's, it's very risky let's say it's out there for two weeks a lot can happen during those two weeks the weather can change things can go wrong um the natural process can produce beautiful coffee but there are places let's say where it is you know a little more humid a little more rainfall or maybe it's not appropriate for it, but people are doing it there anyway because it's kind of trendy. But then there are places like Brazil and Ethiopia where uh, the climate and the access to water, et cetera, make it really sensible to to process by the natural process. So, uh, you know, hopefully people will stay mindful of that, that they don't just do it for the sake of doing it because it's trendy. And so fermentation itself, though, is a, is a relatively, compared to wine, grapes, mm-hmm. um, and even uh, making beer, um, it's still not a very experimental area with coffee. So in, in making wines and in making beer, um, people use in, or introduce yeast and bacteria that can bring out certain flavors. Sure. That's not really happening, but there is somebody who's doing that. It is happening. Lucia, uh, small scale. Luc- Lucia Solis, she's yes. a friend of mine. Um, she came from the wine industry, and she's right. she's been applying. Uh, she's a UC a lot of what Davis wine. Uh-huh. Uh, graduated from that mm-hmm. school. Yeah, there. she worked for Opus One and, and some mm-hmm. vineyards up in Napa, and and so you know, I think I think the best way to look at it is the fermentation step in coffee definitely counts, but in wine, you're fermenting the actual product that people are going to drink, right? The wine grape itself is being fermented. In coffee, the fruit that's being fermented is not actually what you consume. So it's how the fermentation affects the fruit, which then how that affects the, the seed, bean, yeah. right? Is is so it's it's a little bit you know what's happening in your cup is a little further removed from mm-hmm. fermentation than it is with wine, but it definitely matters. And I've seen, I've tasted coffees that Lucia processed where she added three or four points in the cup score, uh, and the green score just basically by using her wine yeast, and and that's really quite an accomplishment because if you're a farmer and your coffee suddenly goes from seventy eight to eighty two. That's incredibly valuable to you. Yeah. And so she's she's really, if people would listen to her and, and adopt her practices, she'd be helping a lot of farmers with their livelihood, and she'd been helping a lot of mediocre coffee become pretty good coffee. 
and I, I'm, I, I'm not an expert either, but I've been kind of watching from afar mm-hmm. and Apparently. hoping that we get to see some stuff from her and, you know, in our local coffee shops. Mm-hmm. Because uh, It's funny, you know, I have some bags of her coffee at home, and I almost brought that for you. Oh, and uh, okay. sorry I didn't. I, That's didn't right. I didn't realize you'd be aware of who she is. So. Well, for future conversation, um, I want to end by talking about a couple final things. One is social media. Mm-hmm. So you're social me- on Instagram. You are where is Scott Ra- Rail, mm-hmm. and you are one of a very small handful of people that I follow that actually have lengthy Instagram posts, right. actual content, actual content, tips, yep. tips of the day. You talk about a little bit. We made a little coffee earlier. You talked long ago about the the rail swirl. You posted something the other day about. Uh, the dry bed and making it so that you can uh, do your pre-wedding in a, in a more even fashion. Mm-hmm. But you, you give a lot of tips. What When did you start that? And um, you know, a lot of people don't want to give away so much content. Sure. So I had an interesting revelation a few years ago. I was a consultant and I knew that I knew a fair amount of valuable information. And it was very difficult to get people to hire me for that information. And they just, everyone, let's just say everybody's a little overconfident. Like, oh, I know what I'm doing. I don't need help. They didn't see the return on the investment potential of the consulting. And it was very frustrating. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a born marketer. I don't like to brag. I don't like to promote. I don't, I don't get it. I, I'm, I'm kind of like a very logical person, so I don't really understand the emotional side of marketing. And I started um, just sharing more information publicly and... Almost, almost out of exasperation with like, why don't you believe I know what I'm talking about? And I started noticing that the more I shared, the more people were willing to hire me. And I felt like I've learned that you can actually walk up, give someone the entire plan they need to succeed with whatever their goals are, and they'll still want to hire you because they're, they're almost overwhelmed by all that information. They just want you to help them implement it. Mm. So even though you just gave them all the information that you're going to give them in a mm. consulting session anyway, they still want to hire you. And so Instagram... I always avoided it because I'm not a big fan of social media. Instagram is kind of superficial. You know, when, when I see a teenage girl in a bikini have a million followers and, you know, somebody with something to say has a thousand followers, it's like, all right, something, something's a little off here. And I'm, I'm a terrible photographer. Could not be a worse <laughs> photographer. Like, truly, I've never met anybody worse. And I was like, you know, this is the wrong medium for me, but I kind of like Instagram. It's, you know, it's a little compelling. And then there's no content on it. No one's actually writing anything on it. I always hated Twitter. I never wants to go there. And... I said, you know, I'm going to I'm going to try to give information on Instagram. I'm going to try to use this platform that I kind of like and I'm going to try to just do something different even though that's not what the platform is for at all. And I felt like if nothing else this is unique, no one else is doing it. And it's kind of working. I mean, got 24,000 followers, which is good. I mean, 2 years ago I had zero. Put up 300 posts maybe. I mean, there's always going to be people in coffee with far more followers. And there's a couple of guys I know who are great at latte art and they've got 100,000 followers. I'm like, geez, you know, (laughs) I don't know how many photos of lattes you want to look at, but it is a little mesmerizing sometimes. But come on. I mean, but I feel like I have a pretty high quality following. And sometimes those discussions get intense. Sometimes they get heated. Sometimes they get, you know, kind of very, very uh, viral. And there's hundreds of comments on a post. And it's, it's been surprisingly popular. I mean, people will walk up to me now, they'll reference that more than they'll reference my books or anything else. And it's also a way for me to demonstrate that I kind of know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And throwing throwing people a bone here and there um, has really helped in terms of maybe humanizing me a little bit. People always saw me as a little bit um, difficult and tough and, and maybe unapproachable. And I think the Instagram thing has sort of cut the distance between me and a lot of a lot of coffee professionals. And it's kind of fun. Yeah, so, you know, but I just it's it's sometimes it's just hard to think of like what tip should I give today? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. You went down the tea route for a few weeks there too. I, remember. <laughs> I was thinking about going. Yeah, I, I love tea, so I was thinking about I should do. I, I forgot about the tea tips. I should go back to yeah. some of those. Okay. Yeah, but no, no, it's good. I love it. Uh, there's another guy here in LA. He's a forager named Pascal Baudar, and uh-huh. he his posts are really long. He gives recipes. He tells how Great. he ferments stuff. He, like he goes into so much detail. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And I still go to his workshops. Yep. You know, even though he's giving yeah. some of it away for free. And I'd, I'd rather have one person like you into that content than have a hundred people who just sign up because their photos are pretty. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't know how much those pretty photo followers are worth, yeah. but I feel like the the engagement level I get on this is pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So. People at home, two two questions, and we talked. We covered some of this in a way already, but making 
great coffee. What are what are some of the little tips, brew, brewing equipment or or whatever that where they can start to improve okay. how they make coffee? Okay, so let's split it up into three types of brewing. There's espresso, which is fine to do at home, but you've really got to be willing to invest several thousand dollars to do it right because otherwise it's just you got a thousand five hundred dollars worth of crappy equipment on your kitchen counter and it makes a mess and it's not that satisfying. So, so don't go that way. Don't jump into espresso unless you're going to spend three thousand or more. Just trust me. Just keep going out for lattes at a local cafe. So there's there's percolation. There's filter coffee, and then there's something we call immersion brewing. So the simplest brewing, most people have a French press at home. You basically dump some grounds in, you pour some hot water over the grounds, you wait four minutes, you press it down, you pour, and that's a French press. So I'd like to propose that that can be a lovely way to make coffee, but there's a better way to do it. And so in professional coffee industry, we have this thing we call cupping, which is you put some grounds in a little cup, you pour some water on it, you wait about 10 minutes, and then you stick a spoon in it, you slurp it, and you spray it in your mouth, and you spit it out. And Cupping is a form of immersion, just like French press, but you can adapt a French press to be more like cupping so that it's less oily and gritty. So basically, dump the water in the grounds in the French press, grounds first. Um, after about three or four minutes, scoop the sludge off the top. Like first dunk, dunk the grounds, and then whatever residue is left, scoop it off with a couple of spoons, all right? Leave it open topped, do not plunge it. Wait about 10 minutes, very gently pour off the top 90% and just stop pouring whenever you're gonna get the little sludgy stuff from the bottom coming out. You'll have a more clarified, less mm. oily, less gritty version of a French press. Tastes delicious and you can't screw it up. And you can grind surprisingly fine for this. Don't be afraid to grind fine. Like because with French press, you'd usually grind coarse. False. Oh. So although that is, think of it like this, almost everybody making a French press at home in history was using a terrible grinder. And they, the grinder would create a lot of powdery stuff we call fines. And they would plunge it. It would stir up the fines. And they'd get a really gritty mouthful of coffee. And so everyone's reflex and response to that is, oh, I'll grind coarser so I get less of that grit. The problem is they were under extracting. Mm. So actually, immersion brewing requires a pretty fine grind. So if your grinder has, uh, let's, say, let's say, a dial of 1 to 10, you should probably be at number 4. So you should be about the 40% mark on your grinder from fine to coarse to make a French press. In most grinders. Okay. So doing this method where you don't plunge it and you just scoop the sludge off the top, it really is quite nice coffee. And you can grind grinds probably like a number three or number four out of ten. Okay. Then there's percolation. So there's there's batch brew, like a little Mr. Coffee, there's the V60 and and cups like that. And that's where you're passing the liquid through the bed of grounds. It's more fun, it's more interesting, it definitely takes more skill, and it's definitely easy to screw it up. So if you're gonna go that route, you should definitely look Look a little bit on YouTube, you know, use a little common sense. You got to be prepared to, uh, to get some practice. Um, it's nice to have a nice kettle with the with a s- slow pouring spout. Um, and and there's one hybrid, this thing called a clever dripper. Mm. And there's a bunch of devices like that. It looks like a little filter basket. You pour water and coffee in it. It just sits there like an immersion. Right. But then when you want to drain it, you put it on top of a cup and there's a little valve on the bottom and it opens. And that's actually quite a nice hybrid because it's also really hard to screw up and it can make quite nice coffee. So if, if a consumer says, look, I'm not an expert. I don't want to be an expert. I just want a pretty good single cup of filter coffee every day. I'll say buy a Clever or one of the Clever-ish devices. If someone says, I really want to get into it and play with it, buy a V60. If someone says, I don't want any of that. I just want the easiest thing possible. Use a French press. Don't plunge it. Scoop it at three minutes. Wait for 10 minutes. Pour it off slowly. And coffee lovers choosing a best cafe. Mm. You, you, do, you go to... Lots of cafes. Yep. I read a lot of your posts about those experiences. Right. Some of them not so good. How can I pick the best one? Um, you can definitely make better coffee at home than most cafes mm-hmm. will ever make you. So if you're going to the cafe because you want extraordinary coffee, you're going to be disappointed 90% of the time. I would argue go to the cafe that makes you happy. It's very underrated in coffee. Right now there's this trend towards sort of snooty baristas condescending you to a little bit, charging you a lot of money for coffee. Screw that. Go somewhere where they make you happy and, you know, prioritize that because that's really what cafes are about. And, you know, obviously in your neighborhood, you have somewhat of a limited selection. There may be this three, maybe there's 10, but, you know, it, it shouldn't. It's not like you're in a, a economics textbook with perfect competition. I'm sure I'm sure there's only one or two worth going to. And I'm sure there's only one or two with really good coffee. And then, you know, you can kind of see what works for you. But, um, you know, if you want if you want a checklist of walking into a cafe and saying, all right, do these people know what they're doing? Is this good? I would look at things like, are they batch brewing more than two liters at a time? And if they are, is it just sitting around for a long time? Like, don't go near those. Um, if they're, 
using a roaster who you like or respect, that's that's a good sign. If they're using something Italian, don't do it. <laughs> um, if they, you know, serve a tremendous variety of stuff, that's probably not a good sign. And you know, I would just, I would just at that point, you know, see who's got sort of decent looking equipment and see who's nice to people. And that's, you know, if you could find someone making halfway decent coffee who's nice to you, you've that's pretty good in American coffee right now. I think that is a perfect way to end this. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you for having me. It's I'm sad this is over, but that was such a fun episode. I want to thank Scott Rail for all the wonderful insights. We're going to take these tips home with us. Hopefully you will too. And uh, we'll all look for the great coffee shops through our own coffee finding endeavors. And a note to take away for everyone tuning in, kindness will always be key, even for those people making your coffee. I really loved that note from him. He was, he was like, go find a coffee shop where they're nice to you, where they're not, you know, a little, cause you've been to the coffee shops where it's an intimidating, like I've been there and I'm like, I've, I have no idea. I'm not, they're arrogant. Spe- exactly. I'm not into specialty coffee. And so I don't know what I'm doing when I do go to a shop that is focused on that. I just need to be educated a little bit and I'm not coming in there. Like, you know, I, I want to, I want to know what, what the ends are about this. So I loved yeah. that. I love that he said that. Yeah. I know some coffee shops, even where I live and I'm not going to name names. Maybe I should, but you go in there and they just they can't be bothered you know yeah. they're so they're so above you mm-hmm. and they you know just tell me what you want you probably want some caramel latte <laughs> thing right and <clears throat> no 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 i want really good coffee and yeah. uh, anyway it it bothers me a lot but i think all businesses can probably get something out of that as well definitely Kindness is key definitely I also want to thank our editors over at Lampstand, our producer, Kendall Fisher. Thank you, Kendall. Thanks for having me. I also want to thank all of you for tuning in. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Bye. Bye. You just listened to the Grow Wire podcast with host Fritz Nelson. Make sure to keep tuning in for more episodes full of tips, tools, stories, and strategies to help take your personal and professional growth to the next level. Until next time.